and uh, myself, Raju Sampangi, we will be uh, chairing, and uh, uh, the other co-chairs are uh, Prashant Bhavankale, Puninder uh, Dogra, and uh, Koshal Ram. Are they here? If they are not there, uh, So we will uh, start the session on time and uh, I invite uh, Dr. Uh, Kamal Kishore who happens to be my senior at RP Center. At we used to be the, the batchmates and uh, I learned a lot uh, from him. He is quite sincere uh, ophthalmologist and he is practicing uh, now in USA. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Kamal. Dr. Maji, thank you very much for your kind introduction. You are so kind and gentlemen. Um, so the topic today is uh, peeling of PVR membranes. So as we know, PVR complicates about 5 to 10 percent of all RD surgeries, but can be seen without a previous surgery. The source of cells is RPE or glial cells. The latest classification is from 1991. It talks about uh, the location of PVR and the type. So posterior PVRs would be uh, either focal or diffuse or subretinal. And anterior PVR, there are two types, circumferential. Just look at the, 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 the picture uh, on, on the right. So the, the anterior retina is smooth, and the posterior retina will have folds, and anterior displacement. So the risk factors, we all know anything that causes inflammation, such as uh, large breaks, multiple breaks, vitreous hemorrhage, excessive cryo laser, and postoperatively. PVR surgery, if possible, try to wait about six to 12 weeks, but you have to balance the duration of macular detachment. Usually buckle is helpful, so if they don't have a buckle, they should have a buckle. Most of these eyes will have silicone oil or long-term uh, tamponade, so if they are phacic, try to make them pseudo a few days before. Do a complete PPV. And then these membranes are thick and adherent, so you have to be patient, and you may have to do bi-manual if needed. So peeling, you always start from the posterior pole first, and operate under oil if possible, because the oil improves visibility of membranes and keeps the retina stable. Anterior PVR, you have to break and remove the ring of cortical vitreous the best you can, and the buckle. And if there is a peripheral gutter or uh, anterior displacement, you have to open it. So this is a, a, a essential technique. You have a thick membrane, so what you do, you just grab on top with the forceps, and then gently apply traction tangentially, and very soon it's going to come off. And I can just advance it a little bit. And here it comes. So there is no need to use picks because they, they, they damage the, the, the retina and you can create a lot of damage. So just stay on top and gently feel it. So let's look at some situations. There is no previous vitrectomy and you have uh, PVR so this is the standard technique in PVR. You start from posterior. You do a complete vitrectomy the best you can. And you try to peel. So the, another name for PVR is hypocellular contraction. So the vitreous itself doesn't have much cells, but there is a lot of uh, traction force being exerted. And you just keep, keep peeling, keep peeling. Once you have done posterior peel, put perfluoron, and the peeling continues from posterior to anterior direction. And this is a, 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 a fluid exchange. Keep perfluoron away from the brakes, and you are done. So sometimes, Sometimes you try the same technique, but it's not possible to peel. So in these cases, you apply some PFO. So this is vitrectomy, this is being done. And then you're, you're trying to peel, Not, nothing, nothing works. So no worries. It doesn't work, so put some perfluoron. 
And now the whole case becomes very, very easy. Now you can grab it, peel it. But you have to be careful, because if you create a break, perforon might enter under the subretinal sub space. But with practice, it's actually quite easy. And here you go. Just notice tangential traction and don't pull straight in. It's a posterior PBR and a silicone filled eye. These are actually very easy cases. So don't remove silicone oil. Just grab the membrane on top, gently peel it. Keep silicone oil in. And after that, just go into the hole. Two pole technique as Dr. Charles described, recognize flat, apply laser, you are done. Now this can be a little bit tricky. This is anterior PVR, and the patient had silicone oil, so you remove silicone oil. You try to open the peripheral gutter the best you can with the vitrector first. And after some time, it vitrector will not work because they are too fibrosed. And then at this time, you use scissors. You open it the best you can. And once you have opened it, you may have to use gutter. You can open gutter, the, the trough quite well. And some part where it doesn't work, you have to, you have to excise it. So you have a sh very small retinectomy. And it looks quite, quite well. This is under air. Subretinal PVR, you find a spot which is convenient to you, which you will as as drain retinotomy, apply cautery, and use two hands. In this case, I'm using forceps and light pipe. You, you pull the membrane and use the other hand to give you counter traction. And you just hand over hand using two hands. This big strand is going to come out. And you are done. So I thought rather than talking about much theory, it's better to look at these situations. And it looks, looks quite well. So that's the area that you use for drain retinotomy. To, to summarize, learn multiple methods to peel membranes. Peel only what is necessary. Usually these are thick, obvious membranes. You don't need much staining or anything to do. And be patient. Thank you. Thank you, Kamal, uh, for being on time. Uh, any questions for uh, Dr. Kamal Kishan? Okay, thank you. you could start the next uh, I call upon the next speaker uh, to Dr. Abdul Malik to speak on role of antimetabolites and biologics in non-infectious uh, UAT. Hello, um, it's my honor to be here today. I thank you for inviting me to, to present this topic on the role of anti-metabolites in biologics in non-infectious uveitis. So this is a bit of a lecture, so bear with me. I have no relevant financial dis disclosures or conflicts in, in of interest to disclose. So broadly, we know that if we classify uveitis, it's basically infectious, non-infectious as masquerades. I will not go into the diagnostics of it now. Basically, we will talk about the management of non-infectious uveitis. So in this region, we tend to use immunosuppressives a lot more. So First of all, we need to speak about steroids because in any case of non-infectious uveitis, steroids are done unavailable first line, whether it be p uh, topical, periocular, or systemic, depending on whether it's anterior, posterior, or parsimonitis. So it's the, uh, as of now, it's the only agent that achieves, achieves rare therapy control of symptoms. So steroids are not something we'll eliminate in the near future. However, in chronic recurrent uveitis, we all know that steroids can cause glaucoma and cataract and systemic use adds another whole lot of complications, including but not limited to weight gain, mental depression, mood changes, and a whole lot more. So nowadays, previously, the main focus is to get the patients of the topical and systemic steroids as fast as possible in chronic diseases, for example, in uveitis, that lasts more than three months. So the recent concept with biologics is that they, they are immunomodulators. So there is a chance of cure. So the process can take like the theory is that it can technically, technically possibly be reversed. So when do we use uveitis? When do we use antimetabolites and biologics? So the important thing is um, there are some primary indications which I'll look in a moment, but the important thing is site threatening bilateral uveitis where the patient has an intolerance to corticosteroids 
where he has excessive side effects and so on and so forth. And we, these are some of the indications that we use. Voxone, Tihara, sympathetic ophthalmia, Bechet, serpiginous, which is ob obviously we have to exclude tuberculosis. GI acetate, uveitis, parsplanitis. Notice we don't have bird, birdshot because it's not really common in this region. It's more of a Western thing, but that's also an imp important indication of anti-metabolites in biology. So broadly, antimet there are, I have divided into four types, antimetabolites, inhibitors of T-cell signaling, alkylating agents, and biologics. The first three, they are, they are actually immunosuppressives. That is, they suppress the immune system. And the last ones, the biologics, they are the immunomodulators that they alter the immune system so that we can change the response. So these are agents that we pretty commonly use. Azathioprine was the original, original agent. It inhibits DNA replication and RNA transcription, but it has a higher risk, of risk ratio of bone marrow suppression. So it has largely been supplanted by mycophenolic, but in this region we still use azathioprine quite a lot because of the cost association. So mycophenolic costs almost twice as much as azathioprine. So despite the, despite the increased risk of side effects, we still tend to use azathioprine a lot in this region. And methotrexate inhibits DNA replication. So it's primarily, it's excellent to use in children, but it can actually basically be used in any form of infectious uveitis. So calcinate neurin inhibitors, these include cyclosporin and tacrolimus. These are not commonly used as first agents. These are commonly added as a second agent or first agents in when other agents are ineffective. Cyclosporin is used in a dose of two to seven milligrams per kg body weight, and so on and so forth. Alkylating agents, such as cyclophosphamide and chlorambucil, they alkylate purines in DNA and RNA. So cyclophosphamides have an, un, they have very high adverse effect ratio, so they are commonly actually not very commonly used as first line. The only indication is uh, necrotizing sclerosis, which is associated with, for, uh, with um, um, Wegner's and relapsing polychondritis. And chlorambucil is really not used a whole lot. So as you can see, there's a whole lot of biologics that we can use. So TNA alpha, TNF alpha inhibitors, B cell inhibitors, interferon, the whole list, list goes on. But actually the agents that have been researched the most are the TNF alpha inhibitors. So we can broadly, the infliximab has been used, it's one of the older agents. So infliximab, adalimab, and etanercept, these are known as the first generation TNF alpha inhibitors. And golimumab and sertolizumab, this, these are the newer agents, but these have not been tested as much in uveitis. So adalimumab of this long list of agents, adalimumab remains the only agent that has actually been extensively used, researched for, for the sole treatment of uveitis. And it's in fact, it's the only treatment that's FDA approved for uveitis. So how to use, I'll just go very briefly through this. Microphenolate, we commonly use it in doses of one to, one to three grams daily. And as a therapy, it's usually used at a dose of 100 to 150 milligrams daily. Onset of action usually takes four to six weeks. And they require blood count monitoring every four weeks. And it's also prudent to do a hepat liver, liver hepatic function every three months in case of as a therapy. So the main clinical adverse effect that we know is bone marrow suppression, but it can also cause hepatic toxicity. Methotrexate actually is, both mycophenolate and methotrexate are actually quite well tolerated in children, but methotrexate is preferred, and it's actually first the first agent that's preferred in juvenile GI acetate arthritis. It's usually oral, but it can also be given intravenously if you want a higher additive effect. So what we do is we give 10 milligrams uh, for the first month just to screen out any side effects, and then it can be increased up to a maximum of 25 milligrams, and it's actually very well tolerated in children. And uh, since it's a folinic, as, as fol folinic acid inhibitor, the hydrofolate tridactase inhibitor, we must have folic acid cover. And it requires monthly, monthly monitoring of blood counts and liver function tests. As I already said, it works well in GI acetate arthritis and sclerotis, but it can be used in almost any type of ocular inflammation. Other specific in in indications include pan-uveitis, birdshot, decays, and sympathetic ophthalmia. It can also be conversely used to improve control of uveitic CNE when steroids don't appear to have if an enough of an effect. And the end point of treatment is actually a bit of a debate because there is, but it's usually continued between six to 24 months. And a lot of, pa a lot of practitioners actually say that continuing anti-metabolites for at least two years 
gives a better chance of remission. So I want to talk about biologics, mainly adenine bag in this case, because it's given as a subcutaneous injection, so it's comparatively easier to give than the other, other biologics, most of which have to be given as infusions. And it's dose is age dependent. In adults, we commonly give 80 milligram loading dose, followed by 40 milligrams every two weeks. So depending on the response, it can actually be given ev every week, and the, do yeah, the dose is treated with the response. If you gain adequate control, the intervals are actually gradually increased. And when we can increase the interval up to three months, that is 12 weeks, without getting a relapse of uveitis, we can attempt to wean the patient of that drug. And it's sometimes used with low dose methotrexate at a dose of 10 milligrams, because the main, because so as to prevent resistance. So adalimumab is actually one of the first biologic trials for using uveitis. There, I don't think there are any large scale studies that have researched bi other biologics. So visual one, visual two were the prototype studies. Visual one actually recruited patients with um, active uveitis, whereas visual two um, recruited patients with inactive uveitis. And the patients that were, the patients who completed visual one and visual two, a subset of them were continued onto visual three and it was meant to reflect real world data. So what was found that uh, visual one and two established efficacy. So it was seen that, um, at, uh, so in visual one and two, the patients were given a ster steroids at a tapering dose for six weeks and then it was stopped and the time to treatment failure was basically measured. So what was seen that uh, in visual one, 60% um, of patients achieved control. But what this also points out is, is that 40% of patients didn't. So as of now, there is no treatment that is 100% effective in uveitis. And visual two assessed the same. So since the patients were already in inactive, a higher proportion, 83% of patients achieved quiescence. And visual three, as I said, it, it's meant to represent real world data. So they had better outcomes in the patients with active uveitis, 66% of those maintained, the, maintained their vision. And the reason for this could be that as compared to visual one and two, in visual three, the investigators were allowed to add steroids as needed for acute exacerbations. And most patients with inactive uveitis, that is 78% um, of patients actually maintained the vision with adalimumab, and 93% of those were without steroids. So they were, uh, they were able to be safely off steroids for a period of time. And no new safety signals were identified. I, will, I won't speak to, uh, I don't have many, so the problem with this region is that biologists are act actually very expensive. So at Limba, we have a generic available, so that's actually the one, only one that we tend to use. Uh, I think and uh, that's the only one that's available. The other ones, uh, they have no large scale studies to support Dr. their use, but they are, they are used as second line agents. Oh. Time is up. Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, same, sorry. So I'll just quickly go through there, give it, go through this. So con considering our region, uh, our region, the main limitation is cost and availability, and they have to be prescribed in collaboration with the rheum rheumatologist or internist. And future trends will probably lean toward, towards biologics as the costs come down. But in this case, it's essential, three things are essential. We have to exclude tuberculosis as a cause prior to the initi initiation of biologics. We have to counsel the patients and they have to be motivated for the long-term follow-up that is required. And we have to maintain co close collaboration with the internist. So, as I said, no treatment is without side effects. No treatment is 100% effective. There are a wide variety of agents to choose from. There is, it is not for me to say that this agent is superior than others. All of them have a place in the treatment of uveitis. And it, we must exclude, particularly in this region, we must exclude tuberculosis prior to the initiation. Thank you for your attention. Uh, but are there any infective disease you need to exclude before starting steroid and uh, uh, immunosuppressives? Mm. Uh, when you switch, switch over uh, from steroid to immunosuppressives? So actually, um, it depends on the disease. So um, in case of children in GIA, actually what we've started doing is that we initiate them at the same time. Mm -hmm. Because that allows us to taper off the steroids quickly and that gives the in immunosuppressives time to work. In case of GIA, in case of BKH, we actually start them at the same time. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, now I uh, call upon Dr. Uh, Nikhil Bhatt. Again, he is a long-term associate. He is from um, 
Bahrain and uh, every uh, Al India Ophthalmological Society who attends and makes sure that he uh, makes his presence felt. Dr. Nissen. Pointer. Uh, hi. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, let me start with this uh, famous quote. That uh, famous quote that an unexamined life is not worth living. Uh, it has uh, many interpretations, many analysis, but to our present talk, if anybody has operated for a couple of decades, one should look back and see what one has done, uh, what were the goof-ups done, how he has changed the technique, and the best way to examine your past is to go to the uh, recordings, the, what we have it. I was viewing all my cassettes, and when I was doing it, I realized that we not only changed the surgical technique and the instrumentation, but the way we used to store the data. Of course, the, this is the beginning. I started uh, using the uh, VHS cassettes, and then the Betamax. Then I went to this mini disc, it's pretty good. Then of course we started storing the thing on the CD and the DVDs, and now we directly store it on the hard disk. And um, the first one I'm going to show you, uh, it's uh, 25 years old before I did the surgery. It was recorded on the VHS, and I tried to, uh, and it, there was a fungal infection also, so I, I've tried to put it on the digital. Uh, the quality is not good because it's 25 years old, but I think it will explain the point which I was <coughs> trying to tell. Uh, this was a case, a uh, one-eyed patient, Marfan's cataract retinal detachment, pupil not dilating. At that point of time, I didn't have any mechanical device to dilate the pupil, so we used to use this uh, modified Macallan suture uh, technique to dilate the pupil. Uh, basically, what we do is just put a 27 number needle, uh, fill the eye with a viscoelastic, which was a methyl cellulose at that time, and uh, take an eight O suture, tie it at this point, then you do it in the four quadrants, so you get a sufficient dilatation. But what I wanted to show you is this. What I did was when I started uh, doing the uh, fragmentation, the part of the lens went inside, and there was a retinal detachment. So I, I tried to reattach the retina and then remove the lens. And you see what happens. There was air inside. I did the fragmentation way uh, to remove the lens. There was no fluid and you have this scleral burn. So this was my first goof up 25 years ago. And luckily there was no scleral melting and the retina was well attached with the silicone in the eye. And when I was going through my video, I realized that such an innocuous simple step in the vitrectomy procedure that is a sclerotomy, has multiple issues. The second issue I had was this patient, a, a retinal detachment, hypotony. So you just inflate the eye and always be prepared that in such a situation, the infusion might not go inside, so you take a larger infusion cannula and you try to see uh, that the tip goes in the vitreous cavity. And afterwards, of course, you can drain the choroid. So this is another issue which I came across. Uh, another, another case I had was, uh, very, uh, this was an unusual case. A myotic patient, glaucoma, retinal detachment. I saw that bit, the, the, the infusion is in the vitreous cavity, but as soon as I start operating the thing and you have a huge choroid. This happened, I tried to check, I mean the, the, the way we do it is the same, you again, you check your infusion is inside. If it doesn't work, you go to the new infusion. I made multiple openings and every time I went inside, I had a choroidal detachment. I don't know the reason why. So what I did in the end, that I just reattached the retina and left the choroidal there. So again at 12 o'clock also I tried, I'm just trying to show that you can see that I, I'm, I'm seeing the tip of the infusion cannula way inside, but again you operate and you get a choroidal. So that, but after uh, this thing, when the gas absorbed, the retina was well attached and the choroid will settle down. I don't know the reason why it happened, but it happened. And this was another case. Uh, I did a vitrectomy and it went on very fine. And I'm, I, I'm closing the sclerotomy and you can see there's a bleeding inside. So I reopen it. 
I go through the same uh, sclerotomies. And uh, once I go, I remove this blood, which was there inside. This I did a vitrectomy, and I, I, I had to reopen it. And again, when I close it, again, there's a bleed. So most probably, it's coming from this sclerotomy. So what I did was I made a new sclerotomy. So I had to go at least three times. It took more time to do this rather than the, than the surgery. And, and then I removed this blood, and then it was OK. So this was sclerotomy complications, uh, um, unexpected, and I think it's very unusual thing. Now from the sclerotomy, let me tell you a few complications of the, of the macular regions which I had. I call this uh, surgery for the vitromacular traction as a, uh, uh, a velocious, a minutest, and prius. In, 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 in other words, fast and furious. It's a very, very short surgery, but very intense. Why I say intense is there is a risk of the macular hole formation for which we are trying to prevent it. Why it happens is because of these strong attachments, and it is very, very thin. The roof is very thin. So in this case, uh, what, again, I, I don't have a paradigm. I, 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 every time I don't do the same surgery for the uh, vitromacular traction. Uh, so what I'm trying to do in this case, I'm very much aware that it's a very thin thing and very tight attachment there. So I'm trying to take the, uh, the, the, the vitreous, the cortical vitreous towards the uh, fovea so that I don't make a hole. But I, I'll end up making one, as you'll see now. And here it is. So already the hole is made. And when I try to cut it with the cutter, but the important thing is one should recognize it and not to deroof the thing. So this I put just a gas inside. And uh, this was the first uh, beginning after two months, then later on. And this was a picture which we had taken and well attached this thing. Now let me show the other case. Again, a vitromacular traction, not a tight attachments. And I wanted to show you that. There was no complication in the surgery, uh, uh, which I did. Uh, this was stained uh, with a uh, tripen blue. And after removing this uh, vitreous, I, I don't remove ILM. I don't know anybody does it for the vitromacular traction. And uh, so basically, in this case, actually, I wanted to just truncate it, but it, the, the whole uh, 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 cortical vitreous, as you will see here, how nicely this comes off. So there was no complication as such. I removed the uh, things nicely. I'm, I'm reconfirming whether I have not left any vitreous on the macular region. And uh, uh, then, of course, I'm reconfirming with my barbed uh, MVR blade. So it went out OK. And uh, let me show you the case. This, this the first time the patient came to me, 612 vision. And I said, you better wait. So we waited. Two months later, patient comes with a 636 vision. I operate. As you saw the case, no complication. And after two months, the patient comes with a macular hole. So I don't know whether I was dealing with a vitromacular traction thing or a hole was in formation. And it is well reported that in an uncomplicated cases, uh, post-operatively, there is a 10% risk of macular hole formation in this uh, vitromacular traction syndrome. This is the case I would call it my second goof up or second blooper. The first case I told you about was scleral burn, which is absolutely my mistake. And this is another case I would say this is really my mistake. This is a case of a, a diabetic retinopathy. You are removing this uh, uh, fibrous tissue. There's a slight hole there previously. Now what I do after removing it, we teach our fellows repeatedly, but I've got a light pipe resting right on the fovea. And not looking inside, I'm trying to put in the back flush needle. And I'm rubbing the right pipe right in the foveal region. And you will see that there is a vitreous hammer. as a bullseye, perfect hit on the fovea. Uh, there is a bleeding. And the vision was compromised. There was a scar tissue post-operatively. So these are the few cases, a couple of them. Uh, this was a case of a vitreous hemorrhage which came to me. Uh, I, d I normally don't like to give uh, uh, anti-VEGF. We went outside, took three injections of VEGF, and I think this is a classic case of uh, problems happening because of the anti-VEGF. So we did a vitrectomy surgery in this patient, and when you're doing, what I want to show you is you can see the uh, thick fluid coming out, um, multiple retinal detachments, and I will show you the tears. These are classic tears. These are not from diabetic. These are from the anti-VEGF. 
Another interesting case I had, uh, this was a case I had by the vitrectomy surgery. There was a uh, slight bleeding tear. Patient went outside, did a pneumoretinopexy. I don't know why. Patient come back to me and you see, just a minute, I think. Uh, uh, there's a large tear, almost a giant tear. And um, you can see that the vitreous hemorrhage is there. And we reattach the retina. So I would end with last couple of slides, uh, quoting from our Gita, some philosophical thought. Uh, life, that is an event, and in this case, the surgeries, is shaped by many other factors, not just the ones we have control. What it tells you is that you know, oh, you are dealing with a case. You know your potential, what you can do. You know the results can be, but there's an X factor. We do not know, we do not have all the factors on our control. So that you have to keep in mind. And therefore, don't bother about the outcome, just bother to do the best to the patient. And the, and the surgery, what you do, will be depending upon your intent. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Okay. Yeah, Barbara. Welcome to India. Uh, you can uh, start off. I'd like to invite you to come forward. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, it, it, I don't want you to get asleep while I'm talking. <laughs> okay. Anyhow, thank you so much for the invitation. I would like this talk to be somehow interactive. We don't have a talk? Okay. Mm? That way? This is not the talk, it's, my name is Barbara Parolini. <laughs> that one, the first one. How to yes, handle that <laughs> thing. Okay, that was me in uh, 2008 when I was invited uh, in Madhya Pradesh. So I would like to interact with you about myopic traction maculopathy and a new staging system that I am proposing. So what do we know and what we don't know about myopic traction maculopathy? It is not one disease, but it is a spectrum of clinical features. There is no complete classification at the moment, nor consensus on the management. So the aims of my study were to first clarify all the types of MTM, and I'm going to ask you them at the end of the talk, study the natural history of MTM, understand the pathogenesis, and propose the best management per each type. So in other words, let me say to unravel the secrets of MTM. Methods, the, sessions were, the study was div sorry, divided in different phases. The first one was a cross-sectional study. So what did I do? My colleagues was proposing before me to review what we do, and that's what I did. I have reviewed 281 cases with MTM that I have operated since 2006. I have operated them with uh, different types of surgery, and I first classified each one of them in type of MTM based on the preoperative OCT. So I have uh, found five types of retinal patterns from the inner layers to the outer layers and three types of foveal patterns. I will show you. So let's start from the inner layers. Inner schizes, please look at the average age. 48 years of age, and the mean preoperative visual acuity is fairly good. Inner outer schizes, the average age is increasing. Predominantly outer schizes, the age is still increasing. Schizes with detachment, here the age is in line, but not increasing. 
pure detachment. Notice that when the detachment is complete, there is almost no schisms, and the age is increasing. So five types of retinal patterns. For each type, we might have different patterns in the fovea, three patterns, a normal fovea that I call type A, a lamellar macular hole, type B, and a full thickness macular hole, type C. So, associated finding could be epiretinal abnormalities or an outer lamellar hole. What is an outer lamellar hole? It is a splitting in the photoreceptors layer. So, the average age is increasing with the different stages. And the, uh, clinically, um, the, the difference is clinically significant from stage one to stage five. In the second phase of the study, I have reviewed 72 eyes that could provide at least three OCT in time, never operated, so just to follow up the natural history up to, uh, with up to 11 years of evolution. And let's see some examples. Look at this male at 49 years of age. He has um, almost no signs of MTN, but he develops inner schizes and then inner outer schizes and then outer schizes and then detachment. So from 2008 to 2017. Other example, from inner schizes to outer schizes. Another example, from inner schizes to detachment, see, six years. And other example, I have many. And I will offer you examples of tangential traction from inner lamellar hole to deep, almost full thickness lamellar hole. And this is another example from lamellar hole to full thickness lamellar hole. So in the end, I propose the game of forces that act on the fovea. If we have one centripetal force that holds the retina together against this force, many centrifugal forces might act. So a centrifugal posterior that detached the sclera from the retina, or the vitreous might pull the retina anteriorly, or the wall can pull tangentially, or the interface that pulled tangentially, but on the fovea. The forces can be combined, as in this case of retinal detachment with full thickness macular hole. So in conclusion, I think that MTM is divided not in types, but in stages. I present you what I would like to call MTM Italian staging system or MIS because it's very easy to remember. So you have inner schizes, inner outer schizes, outer schizes, schizes detachment and detachment. All of them with the normal fovea or with the lamellar macular hole or with the full thickness macular hole. So this could be one table that summarizes all the types. Each of them can develop to the right, to the, to the, the bottom or down right, and not the opposite. So from one stage, you know to which stage your patient could go. Let's do some example. I would like you to guess what you're looking at. So this is schizis detachment. It means type stage four. The fovea is normal, type A, and there is an outer lamellar hole, so it will be 4AO. This is detachment, so it's stage five. The norm fovea is normal, so it's 5A, and so on and so forth. Okay, but uh, every classification has a meaning only if it tells you about prognosis and management. So I have described, I have calculated the mean time that takes to move from one stage to the other. And that's what I would like to propose. Do I still have some time? Am I, am I out? Um, I will move from the classification to the treatment. Just to tell you that I have studied 
I will go to the treatment to know what to do with these patients. Uh, I have studied the tissue response to each type of uh, surgical strategy per different stages. And basically, I wanted to um, find out the differences in result between macular buckle, pars plana vitrectomy, or combined technique. And I have seen from these patients that have at least two years follow-up, two years follow-up, that there is a mathematical response to treatment. So the retinal patterns should be treated with the buckle, and the foveal patterns should be treated with the pars plana. I will only show you the final table, and then maybe if you want to have more information, you can come to me. This is, I just submitted the, the results uh, to the Retina Journal. I'm sorry, I don't have time to show you the, I, I am to show you all the slides, but the meaning of my slides was to tell you that if you use the right strategy for the right indication, you will reach the good result. If you do the opposite, you will have complication. So this is the final tables. In the first stages, you just observe your patient. If you have problems in the fovea, you should use pars plana and not buckle. If you have late stages with the problems in the retina, you should buckle. And if you have problems in the retina and in the fovea, you should combine the technique. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, it was a nice study. Um, unfortunately, we don't. We have we no have time. not allotted so much time. I know, I know. Um, have a safe uh, stay in India. We'll now uh, move on to the next speaker. Uh, Alok, uh, uh, Dr. Alok is here. He's not there. So we'll uh, move to uh, Dr. Baskar Gupta. Update on gen uh, genetic therapy in retinal disease. Thank you, organizers, for giving me the invitation and opportunity to present my talk. I've got no financial disclosures for this talk. Well, genetics can be a huge subject in itself, so very difficult to summarize what's happening in 10 minutes, but I will do my best to present you some recent uh, studies which have gone on. Okay, so just a couple of uh, things before we talk of gene therapy. Eyes is, is a unique organ in itself, and it gives you an opportunity to study gene therapies very closely for these very reasons. You don't need a huge amount of tissue to transfect. You can monitor your surgical results. You can follow them up, and nature has given you a second control of the contralateral eye. However, in spite of all these benefits and the benefits of newer imaging techniques, which you give you like an histological sections, there is yet no licensed ocular gene therapy. And the reasons we know is costly, and it's not that easy as we talk, okay? So coming to the gene therapies, RP65 is the most common disease, and that's why it's the most commonly studied disorder as well. A bit of the gene, what it does, it's a all trans retinal ester, which is a special enzyme for your retinoid cycle, okay? It's a biallelic mutations, and there could be a different phenotypic manifestations in disease. It could present as a labors or a retinitis pigmentosas, or even early onset retinal dystrophies. Before we talk about gene therapy, I thought we'll give you s just a little line about how these works. This, the gene that is being used, or the vector that has been used, is called as a variety gene, Nepropovec. It's an adeno-associated virus type, serotype 2, or sometimes serotype 4 is also now being used, and it contains the complementary DNA, which has been modified with the COSAC sequence. And it is being uh, controlled by the hybrid uh, chicken, and a promoter is added to it, which is a cytomegalovirus enhancers. After this has been generated, to prevent further loss, uh, then the vector is purified to substantially remove the, all the empty capsids and a surfactant is added. Okay, let's look at the, some of the results. 
When this paper came out from the Albert groups in Philadelphia and Iowa, it felt like a revolution in genetic therapies and everyone was jumping that, wow, we got a treatment. These were the only results, two allies looking at the dose escalation studies and they did not find any side effects. And most of these patients res imp showed improvement of light sensitivities, navigated abilities, and some visual acuity, even though we are measuring here cone responses against the rod disease. So it was just an early phase trial. Same group carried on, published their phase two results, and when they did uh, injected the 11 of the previously 12 eyes uh, in a standard dose, they demonstrated safety and that they also demonstrated the longevity of the treatment for up to three years. And as a part of that, they also did some multifunctional MRIs, which shows the cortical activations of the visual pathways corresponding to these eyes. Then we had the WOW movement, the first ophthalmic genetic randomized control trial. Again, it's the same group, same scientists working, and the pub results were recently published in the Lancets. And they were looking at the uh, it was a randomized open label phase three trial. People who are aware of it, this was the study design where both the eyes were injected in a ratio of two is to one was your control group. And the dose was standard as per their phase two results. And what they were looking at the endpoints were the MLMT, which is a multi-luminance mobility scores and also the field testing. I'll provide you some of the data from it. So on the top is the multiluminance mobility scores, and you can see, that, is the pointer there? Oh, okay, so you can see there's a significant increase in the treated group versus the control group. A similar, they did a wide field stimulus testing, which was again, was the very first time, and we see the positive benefits. But what was also important, that we were seeing improvement in the visual equities, at the end of one year. This is the intervention group, and we are talking here about seven letters, approximately one and a half ETDRS letters. So for me, this was a landmark trial, we all agree with that, but it also laid foundations for some of the future gene, gene therapies. Okay, we know for the first time that we had a predefined criteria how we induce the vector in the eyes, but most importantly for me, for the first time, we have a stratifying treatment groups by age and the baseline visual functions. And also, we have a novel measure of visual function, which I talked about the MLMT, which is your multi-luminance mobility test. And also, we had the field testing, which was, takes away the cone function test. But however, there is still limitations. We don't know all the answers. We don't know what is the optimum time for the treatment how long the treatment will last, and we all know that the RP has different phenotypic manifestations, and we still need large studies to see where this could be useful. And also, whether the gene therapies can alter the natural history of the RP-mediated inherited disorders. Those were not the only people from Philadelphia. There was another French group, Galen Mayer, who published their uh, uh, phase two results as uh, phase two results as well. Uh, this was a dose escalation studies, two different groups. Again, similar effects that they noted improvement in the visual equities and the multifunction uh, MRIs. Okay, so looking at this, uh, these are the treated groups in the blue, and these are the or orange groups which were not treated. If you look at the two year results, the untreated group lose, uh, continue to lose the visual equities. A similar, if these patients had nystagmus, the benefit was far larger at the earlier stages, but they still were maintained uh, overall and a significant loss in the nystagmus group. There are still uh, other uh, labor heredity trials which are recruiting at the moment. There are two trials from the same group. One is a rescue trial and one is the reverse trial, both sponsored by Genset Biologics. Importantly, if you look at it, they are looking at the intravitreal injections and the first study is looking at the a visual loss when it has occurred up to six months time and the, the, the reverse arm is looking from the onset of seven months to one year time. Uh, in, the, uh, in the reverse arm they're recruiting 36 patients so we actively wait for their results. Okay, there, there's some other uh, uh, 
National Law Institute is also supporting the, one of the trials, which is ongoing. Again, there are three different doses being trialed. So there are different organizations working independently, uh, uh, looking at the gene therapies for uh, livers. Moving on to choroderma, we know it's an X-linked disorders, and it affects the RAP gene, which is your RAP escort proteins. The phase two results are uh, studies is recruiting at the moment. I think they've just finished the recruitment. So we wait for the results. In this, they are looking at the anatomical and functional safety uh, at 12 months time. But again, this is a, a, a subretinal injections. Okay. There is another study from the University of Miami. Again, these are subretinal injections, but they, were, they had a confirmed diagnosis of phenotype and this is uh, the genotype they have a chorodermia gene. The previous was uh, uh, just looking at the null mutations. I'm coming mostly to the end. Again, some other trials, which is probably called as a STAR trial for chor uh, chorodermia. UK is one of the centers, they're still recruiting. This excellent juveline retinoschisis trial has stopped uh, because the sponsors did not find six month results, the any uh, benefits on the visual functions. Okay, now, a lot of the trials we saw, they were all based on the gene augmentation therapies, but I think, that, so we are getting some positive results. People are not looking at the dominant disorders as well, but just the last slide that people are now looking at the stem cell uh, uh, regeneration therapies as well. So we'll watch this space, though the Stargard trial has stopped because it did not show the benefits, but this is the active trial at the moment and we look for the results, uh, so Scott Stu is what you need to look for. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Are there any questions to Dr. Bhaskar? Otherwise we'll move, oh, thank you Bhaskar. Uh, we'll move on to the next uh, speak by Uguwa, Dr. Uguwa, he is uh, speaking on um, the initial experience of autologous retinal transplant. I, I want, let me start by saying thank you to the organizers of, the, of this meeting and the session for inviting me. And to quickly set the ball rolling by um, no financial disclosures. And ART as an art um, was first described, I believe, by Tama et al. in 2016 in the landmark uh, publication in the JAMA, in which he and Gawal noted impressive um, results both structurally and functionally after they transplanted, uh, successfully transplanted um, into a refractory macular hole, an extra macular retinal piece of tissue. At the ASRS meeting in 2018, a case series was presented looking at the structure and the function of um, neurocentral retinal transplantation. It was an international multicenter experience of about 49 eyes and in that particular presentation, Gawal, who was from Duke, looked at the structure, while Kazuki from Yokohama looked at the function. I'll quickly note that one of the members of this group, Barbara, is present in the, in the room, and she may have something to say about this. Oh. So we presented um, four eyes of four patients of our own experience. The very first patient we had, who had an ART, post-operatively lost the graft, and so this was a bad experience, and for quite some time, we decided not to do any. But following the presentation during the ASRS, we decided to do this procedure again, and the current technique we employed is as shown on the video. So typically, these are post vitrectomized eyes, so we fill the eye with perfluorocarbon, we laser demarcate the area we hope to harvest. It could be superior, inferior, or, temp or nasal, and we excise a piece of tissue from the demarcated area, and under PFCL guidance, this excised piece of tissue is slid into the macular hole. It is teased open and spread over the entire macular hole, as is shown. The PFCL is topped up to the level that we deem adequate, and the PFCL is left for five days. And after these five days, we actually notice that there's enough adherence to perform either an air exchange or a, fluid or a gas exchange. In fact, in all the cases, that I described, three of them had an air exchange only. So only the last patient had a gas exchange for some reasons which I'll discuss later on. So this was the, the video I've just shown you, the video of this first patient, the case one, who was a 60-year-old female with a macular hole, and she had actually undergone macular hole surgery. I, I had performed the surgery, did a BBG assisted ILM peel surgery about four years back. And after the presentation, 
by um, Tama and his group, they, they, I, I felt it was time to call her back. So she, her, her vision was 636. And then we performed ERT just as I showed on the video. And I was quite impressed with the outcome. The outcome actually looked much better than I had thought it would be. And the vision actually improved, which surprised me because this was after four years of a reopened hole. And we can see the structural outcome on the OCTs shown. And also we see the, 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 the superior area of harvest, which is very well scarred, just with air alone. So case two was a 44-year-old male, and only I, and he had lost a fellow eye from glaucoma, uh, from biotic glaucoma. And he was, he present, when he presented to us, he already had a retinal detachment with a macular hole and multiple retinal bricks with PVR. So we performed the VT with silicon oil in 2017, and post-operatively, his vision was 636, but with a persistent macular hole. So we decided to perform an ARRT. And uh, the surgery was done not too long ago, and we could see that the t piece of tissue successfully was retained within the eye, within the macular hole, and he, but his vision remained, snelling acuity remained unchanged. However, he admitted that he had some benefit from the surgery. The area, he kept complaining before the surgery that there was an area of uh, scotoma in front of his vision, and this area of scotoma shortly after the surgery had disappeared. So this was impressive. I thought this was impressive. So we went on to the third case, and the third case was a patient who had had surgery four years ago for retinal detachment. And this patient, unknown to him, had silicon oil in the eye. And he had, when he presented to us, um, he had silicon oil in his eye. You can see the bubbles of silicon oil, both on the retina and inside the macular hole. So his vision was 636, and we decided to go remove the silicon oil. And while the silicon oil was being removed, we decided to perform an ERT as well. And in this case, because I felt that the alignment, had, I was looking for how to improve on the alignment, I was a bit shy on the excision of the, ma of, the, of the piece of retina. You can see that because of that, I didn't get quite enough tissue as I wanted. So one of the challenges that has to be discussed is how to make sure you get the exact piece of tissue so that the alignment is the way you would want it to be. His vision remains 636. He's just had one month follow-up. And this is the fourth patient who had an inverted ILM peel surgery for a stage four, for a stage four macular hole. And post-operatively, her vision, her vision deteriorated. Vision pre-op was 624, and post-op was 636, and the hole had reopened. So we decided to perform this. And what I noticed is that usually we do the OCT in first day post-op when there's still purple carbon in the eye. And she had this amorphous piece of tissue, which actually was retinal tissue. And by the time we did the air exchange, you could see that the there was beginning to be some form of um, presence of retinal tissue. However, I was not satisfied with the type of alignment that was there. The alignment was less than what I expected it to be. And this is also consistent with what has been presented, what was presented by Gewal uh, during the ASRS meeting, during which first day post-op, you see some form of amorphous tissue, and then with time, you begin to see alignments even up to month two. So from the collaborative study, I felt that our functional results were kind of similar but functionally, we looked at these patients. Only one of them had a snelling visual acuity improvement. Three of them actually had the same vision, but they actually did, did say, three of these patients did confess or did subjectively say that there was benefit from the surgery. None of these patients importantly lost vision. They were pleased with the subjective improvement and absence of scotoma. Only patient four could still complain that she still had some form of distortion in her vision. And we noticed that from the slides on the OCT that the alignment was less than what we wanted to be, though it was just one month. We were waiting to see the three months and know whether the alignment would be better. So the collaborative study actually did note that eight, about equal numbers of patients, 21 eyes, 43%, and about 40% of patients had, um, improve, had an improvement in their vision, and another 20 um, eyes had an unchanged vision. So equal numbers of patients who had unchanged vision and um, those who gain vision. But they also noticed a clinical significant improvement in the vision of these patients who were seen. And the response to light following microperiometry was quite good in 10 eyes of 14. So the questions that remain to be answered include this. Is this a beneficial technique? And that makes us think, what should be the indications actually if this is a beneficial technique? And how should we really be taking care of or managing our recurrent macular holes? And that speaks to what are the expectations? What do we expect to tell the patients, both in terms of anatomy and function? And finally, is this a safe 
an effective procedure. And before we go ahead to um, answer these questions and our thoughts, I want to quickly tell you, share this experience with you. And this is the experience of the very first patient who had a failed ILM flap technique by me. Prior to this patient, all my ILM flap techniques had always gone very well. So this patient, very enlightened lady, a myope, a high, very high myope, and she had the first island flap, and to my surprise, the hole did not close at all. And then I went, took her back to the theater, and yet still performed a repeat island flap, and still the hole did not close. This hole actually looked like this. And so I sent her to a colleague who I felt, I was at this point, I felt she didn't have confidence in me anymore. So I sent her off to a colleague of mine, and the hole looked just like that. It was a flat, open kind of, um, and, and she came back to me, she still used to complain about the scotoma, and she kept asking, Doctor, when will this scotoma go away? And I watched her for about a year, and this is how she looked the last time she came to the clinic. So the point is that the natural history of some of these patients actually makes them, once they've had surgery, to get worse. So it seems that if these patients are left without any surgery after they failed, they may deteriorate, and her vision actually did deteriorate. So we have to consider whether we want to see patients like that or patients like this one. So in conclusion, we described surgical tests for ART. Our limited experience appears to agree with the anatomical report from a larger series. The learning curve appears reasonable for every vitro retinal surgeon. And in fact, for me, I think that the learning curve here, this was my very first patient, and um, that you saw the video, the very first patient after a failed one. And the learning curve here actually seems to be better than it took me to learn to do an ILM, a proper ILM peel. So the learning curve in ILM peel actually may be more difficult than doing an ART. There are questions regarding the functionality of the grafted tissue. Snelling visual acuity may not be the best parameter to study if we're going to be looking at function. Maybe microparameter may be the way to go. The indication for this technique needs to be better defined, and limitations, obviously, from this are the small sample size and the very short follow-up. We hope that as more and more vitro retinal surgeons begin to part, um, participate in this, practice this um, surgery, that we'll have better outcomes. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, in this study, did you include a comparative group? Comparative okay. group with okay. randomization? Because, you know, because there is just so much less number of patients who fail surgeries and all, there's really no comparison. But um, this is just a cohort. This is an initial experience. We're hoping that we will um, actually see how this group of patients fare with those patients that have an invited ILM peel, those who also have long um, duration, large size macular holes, and um, well, this is just the beginning of something, and I think we'll just have to see how it pans out. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Dr. Bilal Hussain, he will be speaking on storm of diabetic retinopathy, how to rescue. Good afternoon. Uh, I am very much grateful to organizing committee of AIOS for inviting me as a faculty in their celebration of 200 glorious years of Indian ophthalmology. So to convey my uh, message, so I will share with you a video. So everyone knows that the world is definitely beautiful when there is a good vision. Sometimes due to environmental cause, as the beauty of the world may be disturbed, and also beauty also may be disturbed by the mild dimness of the vision also. And when the situation uh, becomes further worse, beauty is becoming danger when vision is in threat.
sometimes a lot of struggle may be essential to uh, save the vision from this storm. The main point is this, sometimes this threatened vision may be lost permanently in non-threatening condition. I mean, when the vision ship is become sank, the ocean or sea is a bit cool than the previous one or any cloudy situation. So message or moral of the video is the main thing. The threatened vision may be lost permanently in non-threatening condition. To save our vision C from the storm of diabetic retinopathy, a multifactorial step is essential. So you know, diabetes is a global emergency and the number of the cases with the diabetes is increasing day by day, which was 151 million in, in 2000 year, in 2017 years, which has increased to 425. And the an another alarm alarming sign is that four out of five people live with the diabetes in low and middle income countries like India and Bangladesh. And another is that one in two adults with the diabetes are undiagnosed. So usually, and among these, uh, among those patients, diabetic retinopathy affect over one third of the patient. And this diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness in people of active working age. So there are a lot of uh, obstacles to, uh, to go for the further treatment of diabetic retinopathy. But in our experience, we have found there is a more, um, uh, most important two, is two factor. One is lack of awareness in the general people and poor diagnosis at the initial step due to infrastructural facilities. So diabetic retinopathy usually a present, a patient will present to advanced stage when he will see there is a dimness of central vision due to macular edema or black spot due to proliferative diabetic retinopathy along with vitreous hemorrhage. So when a patient will be diagnosed as a diabetes, that patient should be, will go for the dilated ophthalmoscopy because in case of undilated ophthalmoscopy, I, in this case, you can see only the optic disc and macula, which reveals this is maybe a case of mild non proliferative diabetic retinopathy. But when, when you will go for the uh, dilated fundoscopy, you will find this same case. This is an advanced diabetic eye disease, which needs in, in instant treatment. Even sometimes it may be presented with, uh, presented with the tractional retinal detachment from the proliferative diabetic retinopathy one eye. And sometimes we also made uh, describe another eye is a mild, mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. But in such cases, those patients will be also be evaluated through the fundus pollution angiogram, which will confirm the proliferative diabetic retinopathy at silent stage. So uh, diabetic retinopathy may be presented to you as mild, uh, mild non-proliferative diabetic retin uh, re retinopathy, moderate, very severe, or uh, high-risk proliferative diabetic retinopathy, even advanced diabetic eye disease, which may ultimately lead to rubicious iritis, which is a painful blind eye. And blindness is the, uh, ultimately give like, uh, gives a meaningless life, which, uh, which is a burden for the family and for the society. So starting is the half of the work, and early starting is a great help for to handle the diabetic retinopathy. And you will see there is a multiple modalities to treat the diabetic retinopathy. In case of very severe uh, uh, non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy with CSME, after treatment there is a functional and structural um, improvement of the diabetic retinopathy. There is the main cause of loss of central vision in diabetic retinopathy, that is diabetic macular edema. There are so many modalities is available to treat the diabetic macular edema, though usually we use intravitreal bevacizumab and ranizumab, uh, ranizumab frequently. So I will sh uh, share two cases. This, uh, this, this is a patient with diabetes for 25, uh, 25 years old presented with the hand movement vision and that was diagnosed a proliferative diabetic retinopathy with vitreous hemorrhage. So uh, uh, this was a uh, patient uh, presented with the hand movement vision. Um, in front of, um, in color fundus photo, you find there is a dense vitreous hemorrhage along with the fibrovascular proliferation over the whole posterior pole. So after doing the and um, doing the anterior vitreotomy, we have gone for, uh, to uh, total vitreotomy to remove the vitreous of the whole vitreous cavity. And while doing the vitreotomy, we also judge the amount of the fibrovascular proliferation or traction of the um, vitreous or fibrous membrane over the macula. So uh, 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 try to send a, uh, find a cleavage to remove the membrane. And if we, ca if we can justify there, uh, there is a beneficial for the um, attachment of the retina, so we'll go for the removal of the whole membrane. Another most important thing is that there is a massive chance of vitreous hemorrhage, paraoperative or postoperative event. 
So after a, a removal of the whole vit, uh, uh, vitreous humerus from the posterior pool, along with we, we go for the total panretinal photocoagulation. So as there is a tractional lateral detachment here while paraoperative due to a, a cause of break at the superior uh, arcade while removal of the vitreous from the uh, removal of the humerus from the uh, posterior pool. So we have kept the case under silicon oil support as an internal tamponade. Another case, this is a young patient, only 31 years old female, presented as a history of diabetic for only for five years with finger count two feet vision. And that was a case also diagnosed a case of non, uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy with non-resolving vitreous hemorrhage for uh, four to six, uh, six, uh, six months. And as this is a young patient, uh, there is a lens was clear, so we have uh, remained untouched. In uh, such cases, uh, most important, important, important thing is that while doing the anterior vitreotomy, there is a chance to lens touch and ultimately uh, development of the cataract. So uh, as we have put pure uh, laser as much as possible within the vitreous humerus to settle the retina and after removal of the whole membrane, in magnification, though we have no interoperative OCT, but we have found there is a macular puckering at the macular region. So we have decided to peel the membrane, uh, to peel the ILM to prevent the chance of further development of the fibrovascular proliferation over the macular region. So as this is a diabetic case, so ILM is also a bit brittle and friable. So while removing the um, ILM, we should remain careful not to, uh, uh, not to create any break at the macular region. So after removal of the ILM, we go for the panretinal photocoagulation and we have kept the uh, case as a under the air support. So message is that so uh, diabetic uh, treatment for the diabetic retinopathy is available at every stage, but most important thing is that early detection. If we can uh, detect early, and we can go for the fruitful treatment. And after detection, there is need of the initial uh, optimum treatment, which may be laser or anti-VGF. And if though the case may be progressed to the further, we, uh, we can plan for a, fruit, a fruitful surgery. So uh, for a better management of diabetic retinopathy, we need an effective teamwork. An effective tumor which may be uh, which will consist of ophthalmologist, diabetologist, patient, and the caregiver. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bilal. Uh, actually, the approach was very good. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, we'll now uh, move on to Dr. Michael uh, Blair. Uh, he will be speaking about occurrence of ROP as an anti -VG. I'd like to first thank the uh, organizers for inviting me to, to give this talk today. We're going to talk about ROP recurrence after bevacizumab treatment. Uh, so what are the current strategies for treating ROP? Uh, in the United States, currently laser is uh, still the, the standard, uh, but there's a trend toward treating more with anti-VEGF both in the United States and worldwide. Uh, some of the advantages of anti-VEGF are its ease of administration to, at the bedside. Uh, many of the infants that need treatment have comorbidities, uh, necrotizing and pericolitis and bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Uh, it's also easier f uh, to learn the injection technique than uh, the laser, which uh, has more skill involved to do a good treatment. Uh, the anti-VEGF binds VEGF directly and uh, removes it from solution in the vitreous versus just stopping production uh, as laser does. There's less myopia with anti-VEGF, less progression to retinal detachment, but spares the peripheral retina from destruction, and treatment can be done even if there's poor media. Is this, oh, this is a better microphone. Uh, so the disadvantage of laser is, is uh, the risk of anesthesia to the infant, uh, peripheral visual field loss, myopia, still a 12% chance of progression to retinal detachment, which was found in the ETROP study. Uh, there can be anterior segment ischemia and exudative retinal detachment, and this, some of these exudative detachments may explain uh, unexplained uh, visual loss. Uh, the pictures at the bottom, you can see exudative detachment uh, after laser and the residual RPE changes uh, years later. Uh, so what is the evidence in favor of anti-VEGF? Uh, the beat Rob study uh, showed a decreased uh, rate of, react of recurrence and uh, this was significant in zone one eyes. That also uh, in later publications showed a decreased incidence of myopia and importantly, uh, two 
uh, he's detached in the bevacizumab group where there were 11 in the laser group. Uh, timing of treatment is, is important. Um, in that study, they treated at posterior stage three with plus disease. So this, they didn't treat strictly by type one ROP criteria. So they, eyes that had stage three in zone one without plus were watched. And so this may partially explain some of the poorer laser outcomes in that study. It's also important to realize that regression occurs more rapidly anti after anti-bed death. Uh, so the timing of treatment may not be quite as critical. Anti-VEGF is generally used to treat uh, aggressive posterior ROP at our series in University of Chicago. Uh, we only had 5% poor structural outcome uh, versus 30 uh, with anti-VEGF versus 35% poor structural outcome with laser. And this was found in other, other countries as well. Uh, this is from our series at University of Chicago. The uh, bar solid bars at the top is shows a near zero after a spherical equivalent for refraction after anti-VEGF treatment uh, versus all the, this, the uh, dashed bars are the after laser. And you can see there's quite a lot of myopia in those, those eyes. Uh, the, in the anti-VEGF treated eyes, the mean visual acuity was uh, 20, median was 2030 and uh, over 70% had 2040 or better. In the ETROP study, only 34% had uh, such good vision. Looking at bilateral visual loss in our study, uh, there was a much higher percent of bilateral visual blindness in laser versus bevacizumab. Didn't quite reach a statistical significance of 0.7, but if you controlled for zone uh, and hydrocephalus, it actually did reach statistical significance. So vision, visual outcomes can be much better with anti-VEGF uh, than with laser. Uh, also in our catchment area, which includes neighboring states around Illinois, uh, before the advent of anti-VEGF treatment, uh, we had two to four ROP detachments present per month, and now we only see a few per year. So anti-VEGF seems better, but uh, there, there are issues. Uh, so after treatment monitoring is different after anti-VEGF than after laser, uh, the progression to detachment can be distinct and hard to recognize, particularly if you're used to following after laser. In the BROP study, uh, the recurrence in the laser arm was only six to seven weeks later, whereas in the bevacizumab arm it was 14 to 20 weeks later. So the recurrences are happening much later after anti-VEGF than, than after laser. I'd also like to point out a, a terminology. We prefer the term reactivation to recurrence, although in the literature it's usually called recurrence, uh, to emphasize that the disease was not cured by the anti-VEGF, but uh, remained dormant. Uh, in all the other retinal diseases that we treat in adult uh, vein occlusion, diabetic retinopathy, A and D, we know that a single injection doesn't cure the disease. If you do a single injection months later, the disease will come back. We had hoped initially that anti-VEGF would be a cure for ROP uh, because it was related to development, but it turns out that it is most likely not. Uh, and we've seen detachments after anti-VEGF ther therapy months and even years later. So the pitfall is thinking that it's cured and, and these babies don't need to be followed. So th these are some examples of reactivation. Here you can see the circumferential anastomosis of the original ridge and then there's a more anterior a recurrent EFP with uh, more anterior avascular persistent retina. Uh, here's another case with very anterior recurrence with exit A and traction over the ciliary body. You can, this is a fluorescein of the previous case. You can see the large swath of persistent avascular retina. Now this is the worst case we saw with a very tight posterior funnel uh, after anti-VEGF treatment. Now this, this happened uh, six to eight months after, after treatment and the baby was lost to follow-up. So which eyes are at risk for reactivation? I basically assume that all eyes are at risk for reactivation until we have better, better data on which ones really are likely. It's related to the original disease. More posterior disease has a higher risk of recurrence and aggressive posterior ROP also has a higher risk of recurrence. Uh, the recurrence may also be related to drug or uh, dose choice. It's difficult to determine the rate of recurrence after bevacizumab. Uh, the, 
there's a publication bias against negative outcomes, so you know, many studies only publish their successes, but not the number of cases that, that uh, had detachment. It's also difficult to, because there's no defined terminology, as recurrence many times is defined as treatment requiring, but different treaters may tolerate recurrence of more disease before they think treatment is necessary. Is it a demarcation? Is it a ridge structure? Is it extraretinal fibrovascular proliferation? Is it flux disease? These things have all need to be worked out. It's also hard to detect recurrence in, uh, as the, the babies age. Uh, when they're neonates, it's easy to hold them down and slow the press as they grow into toddlers. They're one, two, three, four, and five. It's much harder to examine the periphery because they, they resist examination. Uh, sometimes the, the, examina the periphery can be better examined uh, with the babies or the infants as and toddlers asleep uh, or with optos if you can uh, get them at the uh, and have access to that machine. Uh, also, it's easier on fluorescein to see where the vessels end than in clinical uh, examination. Uh, so, as I said, we've seen reactivation at two to three years, and it's suspected we'll, there'll be uh, later reports as, as we go. Uh, apparently, time is short. Uh, I'll try to run through this pretty quickly, but the recurrence is common. We have uh, one minute, one, two minutes, okay. no problem. We are uh, ahead of time. Even I can offer ba Barbara some time <laughs> after this. Okay. In, in our studies at University of Chicago, we found that 50% of APRO APROPIs recurred, whereas only 16% overall. And these are fairly consistent uh, with other, other studies that, that show recurrence, although the rates are very, very uh, uh, variable. Uh, likely, the recurrence may be less in, uh, in bigger babies. There are less reports of, of recurrence from other countries, and the re reasons for that are, are not clear. But it's likely related to the persistent avascular retina, which produces VEGF, and ultimately the retinal neovascularization. Uh, so then, can we predict which eyes are going to recur? So we think that it's related to the zone. More eyes in our study recurred in zone one than in zone two, and this was uh, similar in other, other uh, studies as well. And this makes sense since you initially cause regression of the extra retinal vessels, and then the normal retinal vessels have to grow anteriorly, and if there's more distance to grow, there's more chance that they won't make it to the aura, and then there'll still be persistent avascular retina. Again, APROP seems to be a factor. Uh, we, we studied fluorescenes, and uh, APROP, eyes with APROP had larger areas of non-perfusion, four and a half disc diameter, so compared to classic ROP, which only had uh, two and a half disc diameters of non-perfusion. This was significant, and all eyes with APRP, and these are done at 80 weeks or so after the initial uh, treatments were done in less than 40 weeks. Uh, but all eyes with APRP had persistent leakage late, whereas uh, only about 60% of classic ROP eyes did. Eyes that, that from other studies in other countries, eyes treated with, with ranibizumab seem to have a higher rate of recurrence than with bevacizumab, but this is likely related to half-life. And as the dose of anti-VEGF decreases, there's a higher rate of, of uh, or decreased rate of regression, uh, as was seen in uh, Dr. Lorenz's uh, group in, in Austria. So our treatment strategy is to follow closely every week for the first first month and every two weeks, and then every three or four weeks until either EUA or uh, the patient's being discharged from uh, from care. And so we'll run through some examples. This is a relatively normal floor seen at done at 90 weeks. And you can see the oroserata region there seen with uh, scleral indentation. Uh, this is a, a baby that had a lot of Persistent avascular retina. You can see some a uh, relatively mild vascular abnormalities. Uh, here's another baby with some leakage at the terminal uh, bulbs. Uh, here's a little bit more posterior leakage, another infant. Uh, this one shows uh, circumferential vessels with leak. Uh, this baby had acute reactivation. And you can see the large amount of leakage posteriorly at the original site. Uh, and as well as the uh, anterior terminus. Uh, this, this again has posterior leakage and anterior leakage in a large area of avascular retina. This baby was treated acutely. 
Uh, so the take home points is the reactivation rates aren't certain, but they may be roughly 15%, uh, but are higher for zone one and higher for APROP. Uh, visual prognosis is obviously guarded, but once traction detachment occurs, then it should be avoided. Uh, this is a patient we saw present at three years of age, had been lost to follow up for uh, six to eight months, uh, and previously was reported to have a, a normal periphery. Uh, this baby, after several vitrectomies, has done okay, uh, but obviously doesn't seem normal. Here's the fluorescent graph. So in conclusion, we recommend uh, following antivideo treated eyes closely and long term, at least until laser is done. And we before babies are discharged from our service, we like to perform laser to reduce the chance of late complications. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Uh, in India, actually, we find a higher birth weight babies. They develop ROP uh, larger stages also. And uh, whenever we are committing for anti VEG, uh, the clo uh, closer follow ups are very, very essential because sudden worsening is uh, one thing which can happen in these babies. Yeah. What is your thought? Yeah, well, you know, in, in different countries with different birth weights, different amounts of uh, persistent avascular retina, uh, different milieus in the, in the rates of other comorbid conditions and oxygen administration, there obviously could be variations. Uh, but with anti-VEGF, I think regardless of the size of the babies, we have to be more cautious. But I think in the, in the bigger babies, at least there aren't as many reports of, uh, of late failures, although there still could be babies lost to follow-up that didn't come back years later that may have had issues. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, we are uh, coming to the end of this session. We are closing uh, five, five to ten minutes early. Uh, do Barbara, you do you want to share your uh, slides? Otherwise, we'll uh, conclude. Um, uh, otherwise, yeah, uh, if uh, any of these things. I may have to leave because I have another session, but uh, <laughs> so Dr. Uh, my co-chair, uh, Dr. Uh, Raju, will be. Can you put the RB very Because it fast. was an interesting study. That's Thanks. why we want to see a, a little bit more I will go detail. fast through the yeah. last uh, slides. No, let's go. Mm. OK. So the message was, if you have uh, a perpendicular uh, force, you should push to treat it. And if you have a tangential force, you should peel and act on the fovea through pastrana vitrectomy. And if you have combined forces, you should combine the treatments with the macular buckle, uh, with the, sorry, it's not working, with the macular buckle and with the vitrectomy. And uh, that was the meaning, because I have tried the opposite. If you treat a tangential force with the buckle, what you do, you split the phobia. So it's wrong. It's really wrong. And uh, if you have tangential traction, you have to peel. You have to do the pastrana vitrectomy and close the hole. That's it. But if you have a perpendicular traction and a detachment, if you do pastrana vitrectomy, you don't solve it. That's it. If you apply a buckle, it will solve the problem very quickly. So the proposal of the guidelines was based on the observation of the response of tissue to treatment, the right and the wrong one. So I hope it will be helpful in the end. Thank you, and um, uh, with this, we will conclude the session. Yeah. Uh, Nithil had uh, interesting videos. Again, uh, sorry, Nithil, uh, we have we could not allow you to the full uh, presentation, but uh, it it was an interesting session, and uh, we could not attract a lot of uh, audience. That is the main problem. Otherwise, it would uh, it's each talk is excellent, and we uh, I at least personally enjoyed a lot. Thank you all.